is, is already lower than what I would think if I didn't know anything. So what you actually set this on is based on the, prob the prior belief and the posterior belief. Given what they know without seeing T star, the anonymized data, and what they know after, the difference between those has to be in the acceptable range. In this particular example, using those numbers, I, you know, using kind of some actual numbers similar to those I gave, we end up with between 0.02 and 0.05 as being reasonable, a reasonable range. Here's, a, here's another example of this, of why this might be, you know, the, the diabetes is one example, but here's actually a very real example. I mean, insurers who try to cherry pick individuals, you, know, you have to be very careful with that. There's insurance laws. But here's one that people who don't worry about the laws actually do. They target people with poor memory. They go out and they obtain medical record information and find people who have diseases like Alzheimer's, which affect their memory. You call the person up and you talk about this item they've ordered and they owe payment for. And then you call them up the next day and you say, well, have you sent the payment for this item yet? Well, they know they have a poor memory, but they vaguely do remember something about there being payment for this item, so they think they really do in fact owe it. Now, the first time you called them, they were pretty certain they didn't. But the next time, well, they're not sure anymore. And so they end up sending payment. The only problem is, if, you were to, if someone called me up and tried this scam, I'd look at the telephone number and I'd call the police and say, look, I think we've got a scam going on here. Because I know full well that I don't owe that money and that they'd called me the day before talking about it in kind of different terms, that there's something wrong here. So if you can lower that scammer's likelihood so that they're going to end up calling enough people who have good memories that someone's going to report them, you know, without getting too many people who have bad memories that they'll get the money from, then they're not going to try this. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we actually check to see delta presence? Well, it turns out it's, it's actually kind of, it at first glance looks kind of difficult to evaluate this. But in certain cases, it's fairly easy. And what this is is a non-overlapping generalization. If you can take a data item a tuple in that table and map it into most one equivalence class. Equivalence class is like canonymity. If there's at most one group that it matches, then it's fairly easy to check this. And as it turns out, most of our generalization approaches in things like canonymity do work this way. So once we have this, what we do is we put the items into their appropriate equivalence classes, and then we just look at the sizes of those equivalence classes. And are they within, is, is the, the, the public value is going to map into one uh, value in the anonymized data, or one group in the anonymized data, and we look at the relative sizes of those and say, is it between the numbers we need. So all we need to do then is check to see if the number of sensitive values in that public table, or the number of things that we can, can map to the group divided by the size of that equivalence class is within the range of delta min, delta max. So in this case, it would be 0 0.5, 0 0.66 present. You know, we have two-thirds in one group and one-half in the other group are, are in there. 
Canonymity fails in this case. Here is a five anonymous data set, and yet I can clearly identify some individuals as being in that data set. You know, every individual who's over 40 in that public table is in the five anonymous data set. So, you know, with respect to this delta presence measure, canonymity doesn't, there, there is no value of K that guarantees you meet this delta presence standard, that you're protected against this type of adversary. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, delta presence has a, or if we have an anti-monotonicity anti property, then it, it turns out to make it easy. Well, what this anti-monotonicity says is that if you have a generalization that is not delta present, then anything more specialized than that will also not be delta present. So if I start with the most general possible, um, okay, so if I start, let me, if I start with the most general possible thing where I've put everything in the same equivalence class, I've generalized everything to being the same, and say, okay, that meets my standards, then I can start getting more specific and eventually, I will be, once I find something that doesn't work, anything that is like that but more specific will not work. And so this gives me a fairly small space that I need to search to find my most specific candidate. So, yeah, this gives me an algorithm that I can use where I can come up with a, a valid generalization. Now, the difficulty with this is sometimes, in order to get this anti-monotonicity property, you have to say, I'm going to generalize everything the same. If I generalize age from month and year to year, I have to do it for everybody. That's how this algorithm works. What happens if I say, well, for these young students, month and year is okay. For us old professors, it has to be just year. Well, in that case, you need a different approach to an algorithm where you can actually go through and divide into groups, you divide into equivalence classes, and then each equivalence class gets generalized. Once it meets the delta present standards, then you generalize that equivalence class. Okay, there's some limitations to delta presence. First, what happens if the anonymizer the person doing the anonymization doesn't actually know all individuals in the world you know, that the adversary might know uh, that are in that public data set. Well, we actually have a solution to that where you make a slightly weakened assumption that you know a distribution of each attribute. You know, for example, what the distribution of ages are, but you don't know every individual's data. Uh, and then you can support delta presence with some known confidence. The difficulty with this is you can only come up with that delta min. You can't say what is the, you can't say that someone may, you know, no matter who they are, they might appear in the data set. And the reason is you may get individuals that are just so far out the expectations. You know, you get that one person who lives to 113. Well, you're going to look at this data and you're going to be able to say, well, there's no 113 year olds in this data set. I know they're not there. Uh, other algorithms? Can we come up with